You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. This is the fifth sermon in what I would describe as this mini-series that we are exploring on truth. Amen? Our response to truth and what uh, we often see done with truth. Amen? And our response to truth is to simply receive truth and then to also reflect truth. That's what God is, is looking for us to do, to receive it and then simply reflect it. Reflect it in our speech, reflect it in our lifestyle, reflect it as part of our character and who we are so that people should, should see uh, Jesus in us and Jesus is truth and they should see the truth uh, flowing from us. Amen. That's, that's what people should see. We know that the, uh, the pattern that we have learned about in Romans chapter one is that people actually don't really receive and reflect truth as much as they do what? Reject truth and then rethink truth and then replace truth. Amen. And when we do that, we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That is the elevation of self. That is self-determination and not self-denial. Amen. Satan is always willing to provide some self-deception that leads to death. Your self-determination and my self-determination will always lead to destruction, but God's self-denial, which he asks us explicitly in Matthew 16 and 24 in particular, to to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. That self-denial leads to discipleship. Amen. God is looking for you to follow him. And you cannot follow God and stay where you are at the same time. Amen. You cannot follow God and stay where you are at the same time. If you're going to be a follower, by definition, you must follow. And so I'm, I'm excited today to, to continue to talk uh, about truth and to try to finish and, 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 and uh, close out this subject. Last, last time we were together, we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and what we were talking about there were the rules of engagement, if you will, concerning the promotion of truth. Amen? Amen. Just because you and I have the truth doesn't mean that we uh, don't need to be careful and circumspect in how that truth is promoted to those that need to hear it. Amen. And so in 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26, in particular, we were we, we got some rules of engagement in terms of how we are to act, how we are to engage and how we are uh, and, and what the purpose of that is. And just to read those verses, it says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strife and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will again Understanding that the purpose of truth in terms of us promoting it is to elicit repentance and recovery from those that we engage with. Amen. And so understanding fundamentally that in a wartime situation, when you see those that are opposing themselves, they're not enemy combatants, beloved. They're prisoners of war. Amen. The devil has taken them captive. And so when we come to the to, to truth, we're setting them free. Amen. With the truth instead of having them set themselves free from the truth. Amen. And so, again, we had some we had some rules of engagement. But now we get to chapter three. And as as we culminate in chapter three, there is we're not really now talking about the promotion of truth. We're getting a recognition of endowment. Amen. Concerning the power of truth. Amen. The truth that we are promoting has power. I am all by myself right now. Y'all better wake up 
and get with me because this train is leaving the station. The truth we are promoting has power. There's when you are in sales, amen, like uh, Brother Rupert is in sales and Brother Kevin used to be in there. Others, they, they have products. They have to, it, it really helps if, if your product actually works, amen. If you came in with a straight face, say, listen, if you take this, <clears throat> This is what's going to happen, and they, they spend a lot of time extolling the virtues of whatever it is. Here's the disease, here's the, because they're in pharmaceutical sales, or used to be. Here, here's the thing that they're, they're dealing with. Here, here's what we can do for you. It's the same thing for me in, in, in terms of private equity. I, we have a fund, and, and our business, we're, we're in, in secondary private equity, and I'm, I'm in charge of the, of the marketing and the capital formation, so I spend a lot of my time with, a, with the presentation deck, talking about my firm, and talking, and extolling the virtues of investing in secondaries and investing with, in secondaries with old brass partners. And, and we talk about our strategy and our value proposition and all those kind of things. And those things need to be promoted. And, and the more powerful it is, it shows up in the results. Amen. Because anybody that, anybody that you talk to in fundraising, ultimately you have to have a page in your deck on your track record. Yeah, you're telling me all about how great you are and how great your firm is. Let me see what you have done up to this point. Now, that needs to line up. And so it becomes a lot easier and it becomes a much more powerful argument if what you're saying lines up with your life and what you've seen and what's happening. And so you need to understand that everything that God says he can do, he can do, and it will manifest itself in your life because the word of God has power. Power to change. Power to heal, power uh, to to uh, turn around, and, and 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 the power to deliver everything that that God says He can do, He can do, and has done. So when you think about yourself as a salesperson of truth, just know you're dealing with a product that works and a product that's powerful. But to understand that. Uh, to frame it properly, Paul, Paul starts out in chapter 3 with verse 1, and we're going to walk through this a little bit. He says, but mark this, verse 1, there will be terrible times in the last days. People's will be, people will be lovers of themselves. You know, as you go through this list, just, just kind of imagine it like it's a checklist and then see if you see these things happening. Just do a mental check. And these perilous times will come. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Come on, somebody. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Wait a minute. Pastor, did we somehow slip back to Romans chapter 1? I mean, I thought we were in 2 Timothy 3, but, but when Romans 1 says they have become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity, they are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice, gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Yes, it's the same kind of thing that is being described because the same reprobate mind is in effect. Amen? And so Paul talks about it in Romans 1, and, and Paul talks about it and repeats it in a, in a different context context here but he says in these last days you have to understand this is what you will see why be be because people have separated themselves from truth and here's even worse because now he's talking about not outside the body of Christ but but people that claim to operate inside the body of Christ amen because they have a form of godliness but denying its power they are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning 
but never able to acknowledge the truth. There are certain things that just people, this is how you can come to the conclusion that people somehow, in some way, they end up being too smart for God. Because they're always, they're always learning. They always have an opinion. And they always have a better way. And they have a better thought. These are the kind of folks that I think literally, if we were God, we would be worn out. Just worn out. Because 1 Corinthians 1 and 20 says, where's the wise man? Where's the scholar? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. That's another way of saying ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. For, for since in the wisdom of God, it pleased God through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So again, they're, they're, they're folks that are always analyzing, always dissecting, always willing to learn. But if you learn everything you can about a subject, but you can't see Jesus, then you haven't learned truth. Amen. If you know all about Come on, somebody. If you know all about botany and the, and the study of plants, but, but you don't know who the Rose of Sharon is or the Lily of the Valley, then, then your knowledge is, is not good. If you can study geology and can tell me all about rock formations and all of those kinds of things, but you don't know who the Rock of Ages is and you don't know who the chief cornerstone is, if you don't know who the stone is that was cut without hands, then your, your knowledge is incomplete. If you can talk about zoology, but you can't tell me who the Lamb of God is or who the Lion of Judah is you don't know truth ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses so also these men oppose the truth Men of depraved minds who, as far as faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will never get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly be, will be clear to everyone. Again, God is saying that, that the, the power of truth will win out. Amen. But there will be some string that some folks will, will play out. There's a book by John Montgomery called Damned Through the Church. And, and, and he said that there were seven damnable epics or times of periods of church history where where you have these 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 other forms of religion or you have these other forms of godliness but you deny the power of god amen and i'll just give you i'll give you the examples that that he gave in the book so just to help you to understand and just understand that these are not episodic amen meaning they don't come and go they come and stay Amen. You just continue to add them so that as you keep going on and you keep piling on, you have all of these other forms of godliness and these other great thoughts that that are away from what God has taught. So back in the Middle Ages, you started out with sacramentalism, which which, which had the church replacing God. Amen. Then you could go to rationalism, which was reason became God. Then orthodoxism had God as a sterile and personal uh, uh, rudimentary kind of routine. And so there was less about God and more about impersonal, sterile orthodoxy. Then there was politicism during the, the time of call it the Anglican church when it was the state is now God. Amen. Then you have eucumenism, which is this uncritical fellowship and cooperation among nominal Christians becomes emphasized. And so it, we, you kind of sacrifice truth in the, in the, in the, uh, on, the, on the altar of everybody. Let's just get along. If you say you're a Christian, I believe you're a Christian. I don't care what doctrine that you're following. I don't care if it's loose. I don't care if it's false. We're all together under one big tent. That's eucumenism. Experiment experimentalism is is God becomes your personal experience amen then subjectivism is self actually becomes God those are the seven things that he listed and that book was written in 1970 you could also add mysticism which is that, that intuition and feeling is God 
Amen. God is God. God is is so is is so mystic to me that that even though there's some kind of revealed truth, God reveals certain truth just to me, and it's based upon my intuition and my feeling. Then there's pragmatism, which is truth is determined by desired effects or outcomes. And so if it if it if I see a, a certain result, then I'm assuming that that pragmatically I got to that place, so it must be truth. No, there's a way that seemeth right to a man. But the end thereof is is death. And this is not a this is not a new problem. Paul, Paul warned against this behavior or or, or understanding for the uh, church in Colossae when he said in Colossians 2, 6 through 11. So just then as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up to him. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human traditions and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. He says, you're going to trip yourself up if you start spending time talking with and dealing with these, this hollow and deceptive philosophy. And you could even go back, you could even go back to, to Jeremiah and, and, and look at Jeremiah chapter 23, and you can look at what what God said about these lying prophets. Amen. Because if you think about it, part of the reason that you can, that you can, uh, that there can be operation is that people will listen. And, and actually in chapter four, they talk about, uh, the apostle Paul talks about that because the people will heap upon them sales teachers. They will heap upon the teachers that have itching ears amen allowing you to I, I, I want you to say a certain thing and so if you look at at, at Jeremiah excuse me 23 God says and among the prophets of Jerusalem I have seen something horrible they commit adultery and live a lie they strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness they are all like Sodom to me the people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah, verse 16, do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their heart, they say no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? And then just one more really quickly in Jeremiah 29 you you know that's a familiar passage of scripture and Jeremiah tells them they're in Babylonian captivity and he says you need to you need to build houses and you need to settle down and plant gardens and you need to in verse 7 seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers you too will prosper he's like you need to sit down and you're gonna be here for a minute but then verse 8 says yes this is what the Lord God Almighty says do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have they are prophesying lies to you in my name I have not sent them what would be the dream that the ultimate dream that they would want to encourage the prophets to prophesy them we get ready to leave we're not going to be here for 70 years in Babylonian captivity. We just got here and we're packing up and leaving. And there were false prophets that told them, yep, 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 that's just what's going to happen. But Jeremiah, but Jeremiah told them, listen, you need to settle down. You need to plant vineyards. You need to, you need to, you need to build cities and, I mean, build houses and settle down because you're going to be here. Don't, don't be deceived by the, the dreams you encourage them to have. So again, it's not a new problem and it happens within the church and the apostle Paul warned about it in Acts chapter 20 when he says after I leave ravenous wolves will come in that will try to deceive and 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 and, and to affect negatively affect the flock he said you have to be on guard for that amen second Peter in uh, uh, Peter excuse me in the book of second Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3 I just want to quickly just tell you that as well uh, in second Peter he says this but there were also false prophets among you just as there will be false teachers among you they will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them bringing swift destruction to themselves many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute why am I telling you all of this I'm telling you all of this because I'm letting you know that there is a power in the truth of the word of 
God. And you and I need to be marked, not in the last days by following false teachers and false doctrines, but clinging to the power of the truth. And so, just to, just, just to help you understand, again, and, and, and so he, the, apostle, the Apostle Paul goes through those first nine verses, and, and, and he says what he says to, to Timothy, and he says, but you, however, know all about my teachings, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kind of things happened to me? Yet the Lord rescued me for all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. Amen. And before he gets to the big finish, let me just stop right here and tell you that, that there, are some, there, there are questions that you need to have for a spiritual leader to determine if he or she is aligned with truth. Here's what you need to look for. Amen? These are the questions you, that need to be asked. This is how you know you're in a place that is understanding and recognizing the endowment, the Endowment really means the intrinsic nature of the endowment. It's, it's within itself. The endowment of the power of truth, the truth of the word of God, the truth that God has recorded in scripture. The first question is, is scripture, the whole of scripture, the basis for everything taught? Or are specific passages used selectively to bolster unbiblical ideas? Amen? If, if, if you're in a place, which you are, where, where we go from Genesis to Revelation, we look at the entirety of Scripture. We understand its connectivity. We understand that a verse needs to be interpreted within the context of a, a paragraph, a paragraph in a chapter, a chapter in a book, a book in a testament, a testament in the, in the entirety of the, of the Bible so that the word is rightly divided. If that is at a premium, then you, you should be okay. But if it's not at a premium, you, you always need to be in a place where you, that you are looking at and asking questions about what is the doctrine. Amen? Look at the person's teaching. Is, what, what is his doctrine? And doctrine literally is what, what are the beliefs that you have that, that you're observing from Scripture? And what are you teaching and what are you emphasizing to people? Doctrine would seem to be kind of boring. When you think of doctrine, your, your eyes might start to glaze over. I don't want to talk about doctrine. Well, guess what? I talk about doctrine all the time. Because it's important, amen? You need to know what you know. There is a book that I've had on my shelf for years called Know What You Believe by Paul Little, amen? A great book. There's another book by one of the giants of the Plymouth Brethren movement early on called BM Not. It's just called Facts of the Faith. I'm talking about old school kind of books that help you to understand. You have to know what you believe. If not for yourself, you also need to be able to articulate that to somebody else. You have to know so that you won't be deceived. And so if you're in a church that is preaching doctrine, amen, you should be fine. And trust me, you should be fine. Marquise went off to school. No, he was at the University of Notre Dame. He graduated. He was living in, in uh, Phoenix. And he lives in Phoenix now. When he first got out there, he started fellowshipping with a group of believers. And he ended up calling me on the phone because there were some discussions that they were having that talked about the security of salvation, the eternal security of salvation. And Marquise was wise enough to say, hmm, what are you are you suggesting that that somebody could be saved and lose their salvation? Hey, peace out. Can I talk to you for a second? See, that's the exact response 
That means that he's been taught enough, not just here, but at Awana Club, at Roseland, at New Life, and everywhere he's gone. It's like, no, something doesn't seem right. I know what I know, and I know the word of God, rightly divided. And when you hear something that's not rightly divided, it should at the very least make you say, hmm, now I need to check that out. Amen. I need to hear that. You need to be noble like the Bereans were. Acts chapter 17 says that the, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures. They studied and they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things be so. They didn't just hear what somebody said and didn't check it out for themselves, but you got to check it out for yourself because you have to know what you know what you know. And you have to know what you believe. You have to know the facts of the faith. If for no other reason than to protect yourself and to protect the others around you. Marquise knew something was off because he had enough doctrine in him to know what was right. And then he was smart enough to say, I may not know exactly where a certain verse is or a certain something, but peace out. Tell me, does this sound off to you? Yes, your instincts are correct. So his doctrine matters if you're a spiritual leader. Then it's not just his doctrine. Look at this. It's his devotion. Amen. The devotion matters. How does the person live or what is his character like? Godly belief, beloved, should produce <laughs> godly living. <laughs> Amen. If, 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 if you are involved in a ministry or a church or, or someplace where the, the leadership doesn't have the character that they talk about from the pulpit, amen, then that should be a problem. That's why Hebrews 13 and 7 says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. My, my pastors growing up, Pastor Yates, Pastor Banks, Pastor Rollison easy to follow easy to imitate because i can follow their life now two of them have gone on to glory and one remains here with us but their lives still speak amen how they conducted themselves how they interacted their pastoral leadership how they handled their families their wives their ch all of that speaks and so you have to it literally says consider the outcome of the way that they're living and if you can't do this second part, then you shouldn't be there and imitate their faith. Amen. That's why the apostle Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's why he told the Corinthians, listen, I can't get there right now. I'm going to send to you Timothy who will bring you into remembrance all about my life and experience. I'm sending you somebody else. You can imitate Timothy because Timothy has been taught and taught well, and he has imitated my life as I has, have imitated Christ's life. So it's not just his doctrine, not just his devotion. Here's the last piece, and this is where it can get a little shaky. It's not just his doctrine. It's not just his devotion. It's his disciples. Amen. What do his followers, dear God, or his congregation look like? Amen. Do they love the totality of Scripture or are they concerned uh, about doctrine and godly living or are they undisciplined, confused and weak? Because anybody who is preaching and teaching the word of God rightly divided will be able to call out in the people that are following that say this is not how you do that. And if you are totally comfortable in your sinful behavior as you sit under this leadership, something is wrong with the leadership. You have to check out the doctrine, the devotion, and the disciples. Amen? And so that's why the, the Apostle Paul says to, 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 to Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life. My purpose, my faith. Then he talks about some of his character traits, my patience and love and endurance, and even some of my experiences. You know how I get down. I understand that persecution is a part of the Christian walk. And if you're at a place where somebody is telling you that, that, that believers should never get sick, believers should never have any problems, that only thing that needs to, you need to worry about is the money is going to come. If you give me the money, I'll give the money back to you, or God will. If that's what's happening, something is wrong. The apostle Paul says, look at my track record in this thing. 
and you can be comfortable imitating me. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. Hmm. And how from infancy, infancy, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for one main purpose, which is what? Salvation. Through faith in Christ Jesus. He says, you know enough, Timothy, to have been taught from infancy the scriptures so that it will make you wise unto salvation. Believe it or not, I can't even get to the crux of what I was supposed to get to today because we have run out of time. But I promise you next week I'll wrap up this and chapter four together. But let me, let me just then just drop this example in on you because we talked about it a little bit at Bible study yesterday. When you talk about doctrine, and when you talk about how important it is to rightly divide the word of truth, and, and, and as we get to this place where we say, listen, you have to understand the power of truth. You have to recognize its endowment, that it is powerful. It, is, it has dunamis power. It has, it is, it's, it's like packaged dynamite. When you unleash the truth in somebody's life, it's, it's life-changing. It is it, it's life-altering. It, it, it changes trajectories. And again, God's work heals and delivers and, and does so much for a person if they can simply just get out of the way from ever learning and actually come to the knowledge of the truth. But that word has to be rightly divided. And if you're ever in a place where you are hearing something like what, what you'll hear in, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, I just wanted to give you this as a um, little bit as a bonus, but, but, but just understanding, therefore, it says in verse 24, it's a very popular verse, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now, that sounds good. And that's in the Bible. But if you don't rightly divide and understand that, that that's just the faith principle of asking. Amen. And if you don't, if you are not taught that not only is there a faith principle, but there's also a forgiveness principle that you'll see in, 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 in Matthew 6. There's a fellowship principle you'll see in John chapter 15, a fruit principle, principle you'll see in John 15, a follow-through principle you'll see in 1 John 3, a fitness principle you'll see in 1 John 5, and a focus principle that you'll see in James chapter 4. You'll think that you can just willy-nilly just ask God for whatever and just expect to get it. And there are places you can go in the body of Christ where they won't talk about anything other than the faith principle that's not rightly dividing the word of truth. That means that you're taking a doctrinal principle, lifting it out of Scripture, and, and applying it in such a way that you end up selectively bolstering an unbiblical idea. But if you're going to be here and you're going to ask me what does God say about asking in his name, I'm going to hit you with all seven of those things and you will fully understand the concept that God is trying to drive out uh, drive through with scripture. It's the totality of scripture. That's where the power is. The power is not in taking a verse out of context and then using it falsely for your own means. That's what people that are lovers of themselves and not lovers of God do. But the power is in respecting, loving, and uh, uh, adhering to the entirety of scripture from the ruder to the tutor. The whole scripture. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's, that's, the, that's the end. That's how you know. 
all scriptures give and it is profitable. It's, it's profitable and it's powerful. It's powerful because of the inspiration and it's profitable for all of the reasons that we said that we'll get to when we're together next time. But I need you to understand that what you are selling, the world actually needs, A, but it's powerful to change the lives of those that you are selling it to. And that's what we are. We are the representatives for the kingdom of God. We have been reconciled. And 2 Corinthians says, he's given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then he gave us that ministry of reconciliation so that we might be ambassadors for God in Jesus Christ. That's your job. That's your joy. To be able to represent the kingdom, but you have to have the right doctrine, the right devotion, and then the right disciples. Amen. It should make a difference in your life. Amen. Godly belief should translate into godly living, not just for you, but anybody that's around you that you teach and have relationship with. Amen. Amen. It's tight, but it's right. The power of truth. And in order to be able to recognize the <clears throat> endowment of the power of truth, you have to know the word of God. Study. 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 To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, in the name of Jesus.